<laughs> thank you very much. And thank you very much for offering me the opportunity to speak uh, to you today. And yeah, as Dan said, please feel free to ask questions, just unmute yourselves. And maybe if you write in the chat, I might not notice it. So go for it, just to ask me. So I'm gonna speak about this, uh, well, mostly this paper that came out kind of almost one year ago, I would say at this point. It is a paper about um, you have a Lambda CDM simulation that you ran without neutrinos and you want to add a neutrino component to it. So basically, my idea for this talk is to uh, talk a little bit about neutrinos and cosmology, but really, really uh, uh, just uh, a little bit, um, mostly focusing on large scale structure and about also neutrinos and simulations. What people usually do, and then go for it and talk about the rescaling algorithm. That is the algorithm that allows us to add neutrinos to a simulation that didn't have them in the first place. And then discuss a little bit with about, um, well, what we can do with this and what we have done in the last year. Um, so a little bit of more recent works and ongoing projects and things like this. So before starting, um, I, I would like to start with some pictures. So neutrinos and cosmology, this is uh, you, what you see in this slide is actually um, a projection from a simulation that uh, doesn't have any neutrinos in it. It's a kind of small simulation and I'm plotting basically the uh, dark matter distribution uh, around the largest halo in the simulation. Um, how does the picture change when we add neutrinos to the simulation? So now on the right, you have the same simulation, same initial conditions. So basically the same, let's say initial uh, density field uh, evolved with neutrinos. And I bet it's kind of difficult by eye to see the difference. There are some differences, right? But it's not so clear. So. I, in, in the next slides, we will see what are the differences also in a more quantitative way and also in, still in a qualitative way, but let's just try start to get our heads around what, what we mean with neutrinos in cosmology before that. So basically neutrinos are these dark matter um, component, but they are hot. So hot dark matter, that, that just means that um, basically they become non-relativistic uh, way after they decouple from the Hubble flow. So let's say in this kind of line of time that is absolutely not in scale, you start with neutrinos that are uh, relativistic. They have a phase space distribution that uh, follows our Fermi Dirac uh, distribution. And they decouple at around redshift 10 to the nine, so super early. And the coupling means that basically their interaction rate among themselves fall below the expansion rate of the universe. So from now on, they don't interact among themselves. And this means that they cannot thermalize. They cannot exchange heat. They cannot basically, yeah, thermalize. And they go on, they go on during basically the expansion of the universe. They, at the time of the CMB, they are still super relativistic. So basically they contribute as a radiation in the background. And you can see the effect of neutrinos in the CMB as different uh, relative um, heights of the peaks of the CMB. But actually here we come now to the point I am most interested about, that is what happens when they become non-relativistic. They become non-relativistic at redshifts that can be around of order 100. It depends on the neutrino mass. So basically, they become non-relativistic before uh, the structure of formation that leads to halos and galaxies starts really uh, being important. Um, so this means that basically all the structure of formation, all the processes that lead to the creation of galaxies will be uh, affected by non-relativistic neutrinos. And in this small uh, little plot, I am plotting basically one density perturbation of one given wavelength um, divided by the same density perturbation in a cosmology without neutrinos. And I'm varying the neutrino mass. And this is as a function of the expansion factor of the universe. So you see that basically 
What happens is the density perturbations that actually contribute to galaxy formation, the larger the neutrino mass, the more are suppressed uh, as time increases, right? So we expect a, a, a suppression basically of, of the, uh, the matter that actually enters a structure formation. And for now, we leave it like this and we get back to the picture. So now I'm plotting the same picture that I showed you at the beginning, but this time be between the lowest neutrino mass that is basically zero and the highest, I am plotting the entire, let's say continuum, but it's not continuum actually, it's <laughs> very discreet. So point, uh, 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 and 0 0.4 electron volt neutrino masses. And just to be clear, 0 0.4, 0 0.3, even 0.2, uh, values of the total neutrino mass that basically are already ruled out. So we know that it's, it's not, it cannot be like that, but I'm plotting them for clarity because clar the effect of neutrinos is larger. So what happens here? I think this is kind of nice. If you, if you see basically the, the um, let's say halo that is being accreted on the larger halo at the center of the picture, you see that it is completely outside the larger halo in the uh, case with the highest neutrino mass, I'm nu 0.4, and it is on the contrary already been accreted already inside completely in the case with neutrino mass zero. So that means that basically what we expect to see is that when you add neutrino mass, you end up with shallower potential wells you end up with a more spread uh, matter distribution. And this is something that is important for the rest of the talk, I would say. Can you really distinguish what happens here? That is different, uh, different simulations at, with different neutrino masses from if I told you that this is the same simulation, but we are looking at different times. For example, on the right, you have a higher redshift and on the left you have a lower redshift. I would say that like by eye it would be kind of difficult. So now let's start being a little bit more quantitative. This sure. is what- Sorry, Matteo. Sure. What, what was the scale of the pictures that we just saw? The scale, yeah, sure. Uh, actually, sorry. Yeah, I think in this one I wrote it, but I'm also gonna check it. So yeah, right. I put in the end, this is 60 megaparsec by, um, uh, it's a 60 megaparsec wide picture. So actually I didn't write it in these small ones, but I would say, is it one fourth of it? One fifth, something like that, a few megaparsecs. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So what you expect is that if you look at the power spectrum, of these, uh, uh, of these density uh, fields, you expect to see something like this. Basically, this is the ratio of the um, um, matter power spectrum with neutrinos divided by the same thing without neutrinos. And you see that basically as you, uh, in, as times, go, this is for a fixed neutrino mass, that is 0 0.3 at this, uh, at this point. And you see that as time uh, goes on, the suppression due to the presence of neutrinos increases its amplitude. Not only that, but this suppression um, basically moves the scale on which it is effective, that is the free sc streaming scale. So the free streaming scale depends on time. Um, so in general, at the, at the, let's say at the level of linear theory, this is the linear power spectrum, we expect to have a, a very recognizable feature of neutrinos, something that if we are able to uh, measure, for example, the power spectrum of galaxies, we hope to be able to find and to use as a smoking gun of the, of not only of the presence, but also on the, uh, the value of the neutrino mass. So this is a little bit like um, uh, motivation about what we want to, why we want to include neutrinos in, in cosmology in general and in simulations 
in particular. So we expect that with upcoming uh, galaxy surveys, uh, both uh, spectroscopic and photometric, we will be able to actually see the effect of neutrinos on the galaxy power spectrum on the number of counts, uh, counts of halos, uh, like massive halos. On the lensing power, this should, be, um, this should be changed by the presence of neutrinos. So basically CMB lensing should be a good way also to, to, to actually measure the, um, the value of neutrino mass and galaxy lensing cross correlation, the 1D power spectrum for um, Lyman alpha forest and the clustering of voids that actually should be quite sensitive to the presence of neutrinos because in the middle of voids, Basically, since the background, the, the, let's say the density uh, of matter is so low, uh, even the very low density of neutrinos should become pretty important. So for all of these, we need models that include neutrinos. And in particular, what I'm interested about is uh, modeling neutrinos at the level of simulations. So there are many ways of including neutrinos in simulations. Um, let's say the big categories, I would say, are uh, grid-based and particle-based methods. So in a grid-based method, you basically add a grid in your simulation in which you have neutrino perturbations, and you use this to compute displacements um, and evolve uh, the, the, the and you evolve the neutrinos directly on the grid. In particle-based implementations, you actually add another set of particles to your simulation. So now you have uh, CDM particles and neutrino particles, and you compute the forces between all the particles. Um, obviously, neutrinos will have a way higher uh, shock noise level than the CDM, so it is something you have to, to keep in mind. But in principle, with the particle based, you can follow the growth of neutrino perturbations even inside halos uh, up to very nonlinear scales. And then there are some other uh, methods and tricks that you can use. For example, the neutrino linear response on a grid, basically, uh, when, you, when you compute forces in a simulation, you can split them between long range and short range forces. And the long range forces are usually computed using a particle mesh algorithm in which you, um, you assign the density of matter of the simulation to a mesh. And then you use this mesh to compute uh, um, the forces with each particle of the simulation, right? And then, but, but you can actually correct this mesh to, to account for the response of the CDM density to the presence of neutrinos. And this is a neat trick to get quite accurate neutrino simulations, but in a kind of cheap and affordable way that doesn't waste so much computing power. And then there are hybrid methods, like you can uh, combine the grid, but then put some particles where you have the highest uh, densities of neutrinos or the same thing, but with the response method. So you have the response method, but then you put some particles in the peaks of the neutrino density. And there are actually even other ways of implementing neutrinos in simulations. Let's say that basically what we want to do here is to not really implement neutrinos in simulations, but add them kind of as a post-production uh, thing. So you have the simulation without neutrinos, and now you want to use uh, a technique. And in particular, this is the simulation rescaling technique that was introduced in this paper on Gulen White 2010 to add neutrinos. And as you can imagine, if we do this, then we will want to compare and see if we did a good job or not. And when we compare, we will compare against full, I mean, embodied simulations that actually include neutrinos. And in those cases, we will be using the linear response method. So what is the simulation rescaling? This is, I would say, the, the main question now, right? What, what's the simulation rescaling and how do we introduce neutrinos there? So first of all, we said before that neutrinos introduce some scale dependence because of their free streaming. So let me get this out of the way so that it's, uh, we have said it. Whenever we have scale dependent quantities, I mean, there are ways of computing them. And the one that we uh, use is to use this code, reps, 
that actually solves in Fourier space the uh, growth equations of um, CDM, baryons, and neutrinos. Well, baryons treated as pressureless fluid, so it's not really baryons, but it's compatible with what simulations do. So um, basically, we will use every time there is a scale dependent quantity, we will use this code to compute, to compute it. And now let's actually get to the to the simulation rescaling. So let me first sketch the main idea. Simulation rescaling means that uh, well starts with this idea. If you consider the press sector formalism of halo mass functions, if you know the power spectrum of a matter distribution, then you know this sigma of R and Z that actually is just the, the, the integral of the power spectrum. It's basically the amplitude of the uh, fluctuations at linear level, the linear amplitude of fluctuations. And if you know the linear amplitude of fluctuations for each R, so for each, let's say, scale, then you know the halo mass function that is like straightforward. So the idea of the simulation rescaling is okay. I have my um, simulation in the in a given cosmology. The first thing that I want that I have to do to change the cosmology of this simulation is find a transformation of times and lengths that makes the amplitude of linear fluctuations in the starting cosmology match the amplitude of linear fluctuations in the target cosmology, and then. I will have to refine and correct for other things. I think it's, uh, well, one thing that I wanted to say before uh, um, explaining this a little bit more in detail, because I don't know, I, I always found it a little bit strange. Uh, so I, I will get in detail. But first, let me just say, everything that I'm saying is based on the fact that present Schechter works very well, right? So let's keep this in mind because we have been checking if that is the case and I mean, how much it works well. So, but I will get back to this later. So let's really try to sketch what's happening. I have a simulation with many outputs at different redshifts. And this is in the original cosmology, in a given cosmology. Now I select a target cosmology. That is the cosmology I want, I mean, to, to, to test, for example. So I, I select the, the target cosmology at a given redshift. And now I have to basically do this uh, matching of the linear amplitude. And this is something that I do at a theoretical level, just using linear, uh, linear theory. I try to match the two uh, sigma of R functions and I find the First, I find the time transformation that, um, that um, um, let's say, that, that ensures the matching. And this time transformation actually does only tell me that uh, I have to consider in my original simulation a given time that is not the, final, the target time, the time of the target uh, cosmology. So this selects a snapshot of my original simulation. And now I also have to correct for lengths. So I will have to either expand or shrink all the lengths, so the entire box of the simulation that I selected. And now if I compute statistics, basically in this, uh, in this snapshot of the original simulation that I selected at a different redshift and to which I applied a, 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 shrink, a shrinking or an expansion, those statistics will mimic very well the statistics of my target simulation, provided that I apply some other corrections. Let's get even a little bit more in detail. So matching the linear variance means just that basically I have um, the, here I am plotting the variance as a function of the smoothing scale. Um, for, let's say, a lambda CDM cosmology divided by the same thing, but computed in the target cosmology, that in this case is a cosmology with neutrino mass 0.2. So I, well, we see that the lambda CDM case has a larger variance 
than the than the uh, neutrino case, and which makes sense because uh, we are considering uh, neutrinos that have a, a suppression of of the clustering. So um, uh, we have basically to find define any cost function that measures the distance at be between these two functions, the, the variance in the lambda CDM and in the neutrino case, and minimize this cost function with two free parameters. That is a parameter that in this case is S that controls the length and a parameter that is Z star that controls the times. So now I do the minimization. I find the two best fitting parameters, let's say, and I can apply them to my simulation outputs. One thing to keep in mind here, we are speaking about neutrinos. So which sigma, which variance are we really talking about? And the, the, the answer is the, the, the CDM plus variance, so the cold matter variance. Neutrinos here don't really play a role since they are uh, basically still free streaming at the level of, um, of the halos that are being formed. So the, the variance that we are going to use is the one of the cold matter without neutrinos. And what we get basically is that then uh, the power spectrum will, if we go and, and, and measure it, will start matching the one of the target cosmology. So here I'm still showing not really a case in which I apply this to a simulation, but just um, a theoretical prediction. We have the power spectrum in the lambda CDM case com compared to the neutrino case in blue. And then we apply basically the, the matching. For example, if we only matched one scale, for example, we, ma we matched sigma eight. So we ensure that uh, basically we renormalize the power spectrum and we ensure that uh, it has the same sigma eight of our target cosmology, we would get the, um, the, orange, um, the orange line that you see, it's not that bad on small scales, but actually on large scales doesn't really, doesn't really match what we want to get. So, uh, Actually, on large scales, it is essential to add an extra correction. That is what we call large scale correction. So it's nothing really complicated. To match the large scales, what do we do? We just take um, two displacement fields. One displacement field basically uh, will subtract the long wavelength modes of the original simulation, and the other displacement field will add back low, long wavelengths, so large scales of the target simulation. So basically now we go particle by particle and apply these two, um, uh, these two um, displacement fields, and we end up with a power spectrum that in principle should work very well also on large scales. And we do the same thing also for velocities. So basically the bulk velocities uh, will be corrected for the same, the same thing. So this ensures that basically large scales are recovered very well, but there are still problems on small scales in principle. And the problem is that uh, the concentration of halos in the simulation will be different in two simulations that have two different cosmologies. So we have to apply also a correction for the different concentration. Um, for example, in the specific example of neutrinos, the concentration mass relation is uh, systematically lower as you increase the neutrino mass. So basically halos are less concentrated uh, when you increase neutrino mass. The concentration mass relation that I'm showing here is the one of taken from Ludlow et al. 2016, just replacing the wherever there is omega matter with omega cold. So just CDM plus baryons. Is this a good description actually? Mm, yes, but we can do better. 
And there is actually a student here at the IPC that is working on this and is preparing a, a, a paper uh, studying the concentration mass relation as a function of cosmology, including neutrino mass and neutrino cosmologies. But for the time being, let's, let's just trust the, this simple correction of the Ludlow formula. So um, what does really mean that the concentration is different? It means that if I take a halo, I will expect its density profile to be a little bit different, right? Different, right? For example, if I have a, a, here I am comparing, a, let's say, um, sketch of what I expect to be the density profile of two halos of, well, actually of the same halo in a lambda CDM uh, cosmology in blue and in a neutrino cosmology in red. So basically the neutrino one is less concentrated. So there is less mass in the, in the inner part, basically. Um, how can I correct for this difference? Well, basically I will have to define another displacement field. This time I will define one halo by halo and move the particles of dark matter within the halo according to this displacement field. The, the neat trick I think here is that we are not trying to match the expected um, Navarro, Frank and White profile of the target cosmology. Because otherwise that would basically wash out all the tri triaxiality of the halo. We, we are not really trying to reproduce anything. We, compute the, um, the correction on a theoretical level from the difference of the theoretical Navarro, Frank and White profiles. But then we apply this, uh, this uh, correction to the actual particles. Um, so basically afterwards we have, um, uh, we have a change in the small scales of the power spectrum, the ones that are sensitive to the concentration of halos and all the in-halo physics. And the last thing is um, that we have, well, the, the last thing that we have to keep in mind is that uh, particles in halos actually uh, get virialized. So, um, but the virial theorem we computed with the masses and radiuses of the a halo in the original cosmology. So we, we have to basically add a little bit of correction to the velocities of the particles, only the ones inside the halos to account for the different, now we have changed the sizes. So we have changed the volume and therefore we have changed the particle mass in, in practice. So we have to uh, account for this difference with just a little bit of correction of the velocities inside of the particles inside the halos. To recap, the, on the left, you have all the steps of the um, uh, um, rescaling algorithm. And on the right, what we need to do to adapt it to neutrinos. So again, minimize the linear variance to find the, the parameters of the transformation of time and space. And here you just use sigma cold instead of sigma matter. We have to correct the particle and the halo masses. And basically we will use omega uh, cold instead of omega matter. And uh, we have to compute the displacement fields to apply the large scale corrections. And here we have to use the, not only the cold growth factor and growth rates, but also the scale dependent ones. And then we have to correct the in halo uh, um, positions of the dark matter particles to account for different concentration. Again, for now we are doing it agnostically, just changing the Ludlow formula with omega cold instead of omega matter, but there is work being done about it. And finally, correct the virialized velocities. So let's see it in practice now. But when, sure. Can I ask a quick question? So this displacement business, is, isn't, isn't it very similar to how, uh, to the baryonification procedure as well? So- Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Can you talk a bit about that? It's like, what came first? F first, the displacement method, I think was, was applied think, 
for baryons, for baryonification, and then that inspired the, the cosmologist telling, or was it vice versa? I'm, I'm curious. I don't know the answer. Mm, wait, actually, it depends because, sorry, for, for one second, I thought about the large scale rescaling, and that came first for sure. Mm -hmm. But actually, probably you were thinking about the, the, the displacements for the concentration correction, and mm -hmm. then it came, the baryonification came first. Yes, that was our, our thinking. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, and it's really the same idea. Yeah. Yeah, nice. Also, the the fact that we don't also in the baryonification case we don't impose um, uh, a profile, but we compute the, the the differences and then we correct for the differences, but that doesn't impose to to recover a given profile. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly the same idea. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So just to see to see this in practice, uh, what I'm plotting here in blue the positions of a super small simulation with our neutrinos, and in orange the positions of the particles of a simulation with neutrinos. So now we take the one with our neutrinos. We apply all this machinery, we go back in time, apply the length transformation, and the blue points move, and they basically go on top of the orange points. And to see it in a bit more quantitative way, this means that basically the power spectrum measured in the rescaled simulation is compatible with the one in the full embodied simulation with neutrinos within 1% and basically on scales. Uh, well, here I'm showing until K1, but actually I have the other plot until K2. And I don't know why I don't, <laughs> I'm not showing that. Anyway, uh, you find it in the, in the paper. So until K2, one, basically we find an agreement around 1% for basically all the neutrino masses that are viable now. And then we do the same exercise for the halos. So here you have the positions of the halos and their uh, mass represented by the size of the, of the marker. We apply all the machinery and now the blue points go basically on top uh, of the orange points that are the target cosmology. And again, if you compare the halo mass function uh, for different neutrino masses, uh, taking the ratio of the rescaled one with respect to the one obtained with the full embody, Basically, we find that we are 5% um, accurate on all these uh, halo masses. Um, I showed you everything around redshift 0.5, but we checked redshift 0, 0.5, 1, 2, until redshift 2. So let's just recap a little bit what, what are the main findings, I would say, of of the paper, and then we, we expand a little bit on that. So uh, we modified the rescaling technique to account also for neutrinos. We found that the matter power spectrum is uh, uh, recovered to an accuracy of 1% for K uh, smaller than two, so from until quite small scales, and for all the neutrino masses that are currently viable. We have a 5% uh, accuracy for the halo mass function. And we also checked the uh, two-point correlation function of sub in, in redshift space. And we found a 5% accuracy for the monopole and the quadrupole uh, until quite small scales. Just a note. So uh, it is true that I'm saying that we are finding 1% accurate results. But are they really accurate? Because we are comparing to simulations in which, if you remember, I, I said we're using the, uh, the linear response uh, algorithm to simulate neutrinos. So in principle, in our full embodied simulations, uh, neutrinos enter at a linear level, and then they feel the nonlinearity coming from the CDM. But actually, it has been shown that if you are looking at the neutrino power spectrum, this is a big problem. Like, it's not a good way to, to work. But this actually changes the 
cold matter power spectrum by less than 0.1%. Uh, so basically, we think we are fine doing this comparison like this. But in principle, it would it could be nice to, to compare also with full embody with particles, for example, neutrinos treated as particles. But for now, I think we are, we are quite happy like that. And now, basically, what I wanted to do uh, in the reminder of, of this talk is to expand a little bit on this, uh, because actually this project about adding neutrinos is part of a larger project that is called BACCO, Bias and Clustering Calculations Optimized, um, in which basically the main goal is to use simulations for doing forward modeling. So basically, we want to directly uh, use simulations to compute models. So the main idea is to have few very well done simulations, high resolution, large uh, boxes, whatever, that we can rescale to any cosmology, including neutrinos, of course. And then we can apply other things, for example, uh, prescriptions to include baryons, for example, the baryonification prescription, or prescriptions to include galaxies, for example, shame, that is this extended sham version. Sham is sub, uh, subhalo abundance matching. So um, this is the main idea. And we are basically a group in San Sebastian. Uh, that is this nice place. I'm pretty happy to be here. <laughs> um, the group is uh, composed of Raul Angulo, that is the API. And then uh, we have Giovanni Rico and Daniel uh, Lopez Cano. Giovanni is working on the baryonification part, and uh, Daniel Lopez Cano is working on the concentration mass relations. And then uh, we have uh, the postdocs. We have uh, Juanas uh, Chavez Montero, who is working on um, neural networks uh, to uh, assign colors to galaxies in MOX. Sergio Contreras is our expert of uh, basically uh, galaxy formation models. Marcos Pellejero Ibanez is working on uh, bias models and, uh, and also on theoretical uh, errors, so in, in Bayesian statistics. Yetli Rosas Guevara is uh, working with hydrodynamic simulations, and in particular, she looks at the formation of bars in uh, spiral galaxies. Sorry? Ah, oops, <laughs> I thought somebody was asking a question. And Jens Stucker is uh, our expert on uh, Lagrangian uh, bias and uh, on dark, uh, so, sorry, warm dark matter simulations. And then there is me that I guess I never lived in a city, in a seaside city, so I got a little bit excited about that. And in the last year, starting from this project and the inclusion of neutrinos, we uh, extended a little bit the results of that, that I showed you until now. And I want you ju just to give a sketch of three works that we, we um, in which we, were, uh, we worked, basically. So one is uh, the work of Sergio Contreras that uh, basically uh, up to here, I showed you what happens if we rescale just to add neutrinos, but actually then he changed all the parameters of the cosmological uh, uh, model, including neutrinos, and checked the accuracy of the rescaling algorithm when you change everything at the same time. So uh, one, one result that uh, from his work is that he found uh, four cosmologies that are our anchors, let's say our starting point, we ran simulations in those four cosmologies. And then starting from those four cosmologies, we can rescale to any other cosmology. And these cosmologies were chosen to minimize the rescaling errors in the parameter space that we consider, that is 10 sigmas around the Planck best fits. And what he found is basically that for dark matter, halos and sabelos, we have an accuracy of 3% on the uh, power spectrum of these tracers um, at redshift zero and one. He looked at these two redshifts, 
basically for all the cosmological parameters. Once we apply all the corrections, large, large scale and small scale corrections. Um, and starting from that work and specifically from the four cosmologies that we use as anchors to then go around and, and explore the parameter space, we ran those four simulations uh, in a better version with larger box sizes and um, a lot of particles. Basically, we spent 10 million CPU hours at Mare Nostrum for, for that. And then we were able to uh, rescaling those four simulations to 800 uh, different cosmologies build an emulator of the cold matter power spectrum that covers basically scales until k5 and redshifts until 1.5 from 0 to 1.5 and uh, just as an example we have here one of the four simulations that is nania uh, and basically you see that there is uh, a lot of uh, dynamical range, let's say, from uh, you can see all the structures, uh, uh, both on very large scales and then the details of, uh, of structure around halos and inside halos. And in particular, this emulator that we built from these four simulations um, includes neutrinos. So, for example, this is the neutrino suppression, basically the same plot that I showed you at the very beginning. But at that time, I showed you the linear version of it. And this is with uh, the fully nonlinear neutrino suppression computed from uh, with our emulator. And actually, to mm, this emulator now entered uh, the neutrino comparison project in Euclid, where uh, basically um, this quantity, the suppression induced by neutrinos, is being compared. Uh, between what we get from different embody codes and from different ways of, uh, of basically computing it to see if there is convergence between the different implementations. And we will see about it. I think it started not too much ago, but uh, we will, I mean, th there will be updates on that side. And then let me uh, finish with a couple of things. One is what I'm currently working on, that is extensions Basically, now we have the possibility to rescale a simulation to uh, give any neutrino mass uh, cosmology. But what I would really like to understand is how much information are we going to be able to uh, extract from the galaxy clustering in the end? Because when we rescale uh, dark matter, um, we, well, not just rescaling, but when we look at dark matter, we have a very clear suppression with high signal to, to noise, and we can use a number of ways from simulations to other um, uh, even perturbation theory to predict the shape of this uh, feature. But then already when we move to halos, the, the suppression is smaller. There is a large degeneracy with the large scale bias, basically on one side, neutrinos, they, they suppress, they move down the spectrum, but then uh, on the other side, the bias uh, tends to move it up. So um, uh, it's true that the neutrino suppression is scale dependent, but you already see that when you look at halos, the, the scale dependence is smaller than the one for, uh, for matter. And it's a little bit more similar to the one that you expect from linear theory. And then when you start looking at sub -halos, and in this case, uh, I say galaxies because these sub -halos are uh, I, I already applied to them a Sabelo abundance matching, and I'm matching basically the stellar mass uh, function. So it's similar to what you would expect for galaxies. There are scale dependencies that weren't there before. So you will need a more complicated biasing scheme to capture all this. And I think it's interesting to look at this and see how much the more difficult, more complicated biases scheme um, is, is uh, basically degenerate with the neutrino effects. Actually, the more complicated bias scheme that we chose in the end to adopt is a Lagrangian bias scheme. Uh, that, um, I mean, we are working on that and we created an emulator to, to predict all the let's say all the terms that enter it, but now we have to, uh, to really 
check how much it is degenerate with, with neutrino effects. So before closing for real, let me just say at the beginning I said, is it really the case that present sector works so well that we can rely on it for all these things uh, with rescaling? So Lourdes Sondaro, she has been a, a student, a, a summer student at, at the IPC and she will, she's coming back for a PhD here. And she's been working on looking at the universality or non-universality of the hello mass function. So basically in a paper that is almost ready and will be out soon, she uh, found that if uh, when we model the mass function, we include two extra parameters that is uh, the effective spectral uh, tilt that is basically NS, the spectral index, but a little bit more complicated, but really no need for details here and the growth rate um, the mass function is really, really non-universal. So what this means is that, let's say I have two cosmologies with the same redshift um, zero uh, power spectrum. They have the same power spectrum, so they have the same linear densities. So they should have the same mass function, but actually they, they might not have the same mass function because the mass function is affected by the accretion history of the halos. So if I started, for example, with a very shallow power spectrum with a lot of small scale fluctuations, and I have a very fast growth because I have a high growth rate, it's not the same as if I have to build up all the, the halos from very few uh, small scale fluctuations that grow very slowly. So with the model she, she has developed, actually we can find, uh, well, first uh, it's in, interesting for the universality of mass function per se, but uh, for the rescaling, we can find that I told you that in my paper, for example, I found that the mass function was scaled with 5% accuracy and with her correction, we get to 1% accuracy. Um, actually here is a plot from her draft in which you say basically with the dotted lines, what happens if you don't correct for this, for the non-universality of the mass function, this is the mass function scaled divided by the target. And the dotted lines, they spread around the, the expected value. But then when you apply the correction she's been working on, you get the solid lines and you see they are way uh, more compatible with one. So basically we, improve a lot the, the scaling. And I think with this, I will conclude just to, since I talked about many things, just to recap a little bit, I presented you basically this paper in which we added the, uh, we added neutrinos to the rescaling technique that allows you to take a simulation without neutrinos and add neutrinos to it, accounting for the scale dependencies that are typical of neutrino cosmologies we find that basically for the power spectrum of matter halos and subhalos on basically all the scales and redshifts that are relevant for galaxy formation, we can do the rescaling with an accuracy of two, 3% um, in both real and redshift space and uh, a 5% accuracy for the halo mass function, but actually it's going to be even better after we apply the corrections of this uh, paper in preparation. And all of this is part of a larger project that is basically the backup project that tries to follow our model uh, and create models directly from, from simulations, including also baryons and galaxies. And I haven't talked about this because I mean, there wasn't time, but just want you to keep in mind that if we do forward modeling in this way, we have also to consider theory errors when we compare data and uh, models. And we've been working a little bit also on this. So if you're interested, check out, for example, the paper about, uh, about this by, by Marcos. And I think from my side, it's, it's all. And I'll gladly take questions if you have any. <laughs>